Hello everybody and welcome back to the Movie Scramble podcast. Today we are going to round off our Hellraiser special series with part three of our Hellraiser special, the last four movies. Now unfortunately they made a tenth one. It was nice and simple. Part one had three films, part two had three films and part three has four films unfortunately because we didn't really think the ten films as a podcast of its own. That's on us. If you think it does, please get in contact with us. And we'll happily do one, but we decided to bundle it all together. Uh, first off, I am not joined by Mary because she's a shite bag and refused to watch his movies, but suffering for your sins is John. How are you, John? Yeah, I'm pretty good, Thomas. Not bad. Just when you mentioned Mary being a shite bag there, that's exactly what I was thinking when you said that. A uh, total shite bag that she wouldn't watch any of the Hellraiser films. Having sat through them now, I'm a wee bit angry <laughs> still. <over. laughs> <laughs> but not yes. much. <laughs> if you, there's definitely a, a line, a, a graph, a quality graph. If you go from the first movie to to here, uh, it goes one way, really. Yeah, pretty much. Yes, yeah. the the odd bump, but uh, yeah. The odd bump, yeah. Well, if you've been up to date with Hellraiser movies, you know we've covered the first six until this point, and now we're going to talk about the seventh entry in the series, Hellraiser: Deader. Whoever you are. You were meant to find me today. There is no turning back. And above all, don't open the box. This tells the story of a journalist who uncovers an underground group who can bring back the dead and slowly becomes drawn into their worlds. Now, you, like most people on the planet, you read that synopsis and you think to yourself, what has that got to do with Hellraiser? The answer is, not a lot. This was originally a... Uh, script about a totally different movie, a totally different idea by Neil Marshall Stevens. Nothing to do with Hellraiser in any way, shape or form, but the studio decided, let's make a Hellraiser movie. So Tim Day drastically rewrote it, including a new third act, shoehorned Pinhead into it. Yeah, this is my least favourite movie of the franchise. I didn't mind it too much the first time I watched it. and On my rewatch, I was like, this is terrible. Um, even take away all the Hellraiser elements, it's a pretty poor horror movie, in my opinion. Put the Hellraiser stuff into it, it just makes it worse. <laughs> What's your thoughts, John? I'm pretty much with you there, unfortunately. I thought it was going to be good, actually, because when it started, and uh, there was the opening in the junkie squat, and it was quite CD and everything, and I thought, well, this could be good, but then it changes right away when you find out that uh, the main character, Amy, is actually a, a reporter, so she's there just to get a story, and what follows on from there is she goes back to her office and her boss puts her onto this story in Bucharest. It tailed off a wee bit from there, unfortunately, because didn't really have the the story to carry it forward, unfortunately. Like you say, it felt like a film that had the Hellraiser elements shoehorned into it. It was a story that could have been basically anything. It wasn't necessarily a Hellraiser movie at all. And it was just... it was actually just a bit boring, to be perfectly honest. There was nothing that really sort of grabs you from the start. And it just kind of rolls along. And just when you think something's going to start to get interesting, then you, you just go, no, it just it just drops away again, which is just, it's a bit of a shame, really. Because, as I say, at the start, there was some good elements to it. There was a couple of good jump scares, which I wasn't prepared for which is always nice and you always get a wee buzz. But it just seemed to be a bit meh, unfortunately. Yeah. And that, I think that's a bit of the biggest problem in this movie, that it is just very bland. There's nothing like hateful about it. There's nothing kind of watching like, oh my God, this is so bad. This is terrible. It's just, just, it's just there. And it's a shame because there is some interesting points, as you mentioned, John, especially at the beginning. And it's almost got this idea of a supernatural snuff movie. When she, Amy has a videotape, she's investigating the ritualistic murder of this cult called the Deaders, hence the, the name of the movie. And the idea that they're killing people and bring them back to life, it's, it's, like a, it's like a horror version of Flatliners, in a way. And I, again, I was watching this film, and for the first like, 10-15 minutes, I was quite invested. 
And as the movie went on, I was just bored. And then it was bringing in these subplots to do with Amy being a survivor of abuse, which I didn't think really did anything for her character or the actual plot overall. And the main villain, played by Paul Rees, is Winter Le Marchand, who's supposed to be the descendant of the toy maker who created the puzzle box, which should have been, it should have been a good idea. It should have been, unfortunately. It was a terrible idea because I can understand why he characterised himself in that way, obviously being a descendant of a, well, it wasn't even a French nobleman, but sort of a, a Frenchman. So he, he said, oh, well, you know, I have to be quite stylish and everything, and it's the long flowing hair and all that, and the sort of slightly superior attitude. But it just came across as just been a bit, a bit weird. And you're just going, what's going on here? This is just, it wasn't menacing in any way. And for somebody who supposedly was leading a cult, he had very little personality about him, which is not a very nice thing to say, but unfortunately it's, just, it's very true, which is just a bit, yeah, it fitted in with the rest of the film, let's put it that way. It was an element that really the story could have done without. And I've made a point through these films of trying to, taking a note of when the character of Pinhead actually makes an appearance now. It's been all over the place. Sometimes it turns up really early, sometimes it's really late. Here he turned up around about the 27 minute mark. And that was obviously meant to be a, a point where the film was going to turn and become more sinister and more dark. But by that point, I think they probably lost the audience. Like you say, the earlier stuff in it was quite interesting. The scene when she arrives in Bucharest and goes to the flat, looking for the girl who had sent the videotape to London. That was quite good. That was quite interesting. There was some nice wee bits in there. But, yeah, once you get introduced to this guy, and, like, was it in the subway she yeah. saw him first? And he wasn't wearing any shoes, and he was wearing this long flowing coat and all this, you know. And I think it, he wanted to be a wee bit like Christopher Lambert or something like that, but it just didn't pull it off somehow. And that's it's, in, it's interesting you mentioned Christopher Lambert there because my first thoughts to this movie, style wise, is it was very, very dated at the time. Mm. It's, it's, for a 2005 movie, it looks dated and it doesn't look like a movie from that time. It, it does have a, I don't know if MTV looks the right feel about it. It's got a very trying to be cool and stylish, and it's really not. And yeah. it almost has a. Buffy stroke angel vibe to it, and that's not a, a dig at either of those shows because I think those shows are excellent. But those shows are those shows, and this mm -hmm. isn't a, something that you try and emulate that style, in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? They were doing that, but that's what it reminded me. It was directed by uh, Rick Botta, who did the previous movie as well, so he's a returning director, which I think is a first for the franchise. Yeah, like you say, it did look a bit sort of MTV-ish because there was an awful lot of blue lights and smoke and mist and things like that in various parts of it that just didn't really pull off at all. There were scenes in dungeons and stuff like that, and it, you're right, it, it, it was like something out of a, a pop video. It just... It, it did date it quite severely. And because of the, the techniques that they used, it was quite almost like fluffy. It wasn't, there wasn't any sort of sharpness to any of the, the elements. And you kind of need that in a good horror film. You need like a certain grittiness to it to sort of reinforce any sort of horror elements that are on, on screen. But we you know when something looks like a Berlin video in the background, then it doesn't really pull it off. You're, you're waiting for Tom Cruise to turn up while they're singing take my breath away or something like that. It's not really going to happen. <laughs> it doesn't really get you in the mood for, for the dude coming out with the pins in his face, does it? Yeah, definitely. And regarding the, the, the style and the look of the movie and all that was discussed, this felt the least like a Hellraiser movie, and that's saying something at this mm. point. Yeah, it just it, it didn't really feel like one at all. And I mean, can we just go back to the title for a minute? Hellraiser Deader just sounds awful. awful. You know, that's just it's a bloody awful title. You call this movie Deader, and yeah, that's fine. That's okay. But, yeah. 
No, I no. mean, if you were going to call it something, you would have, like, obviously, Deader represents the Deaders. You said the cult, yeah. but why, why is it not called something like the cult of the Deaders or something like that? That would know, be fine. Something be slightly fine. more interesting, and it actually explains things a little better than, because if you just saw that and you said, hell, there's a Deader, you just go, no, no, I'm not going to buy a film with a typo on it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I had read that Scott Derrickson, who directed Inferno, was asked to return. Do you think that would have helped the movie in any way? Because we both discussed how Inferno was a surprising, surprisingly yeah, good. I think it would. He's got a, a very good visual style about him. So even with a film like this, which had, or had obviously a very limited budget, I think he would have been able to do something, especially the filming that they did that represented Bucharest. I don't know if it actually was Bucharest, but there was a, a lot of potential there because you've got your older, more gothic buildings and you had sort of run-down areas and everything as well. So, yeah, the potential was there if you have a, a director as a, a, a reasonable amount of vision about them, but it just didn't seem to come across here at all. Just yeah, very, but very bland. The movie was filmed in Romania. Yeah. Which is probably the only reason why she was sent to Bucharest in the script. Well, usually they, they film in Romania and they call it somewhere else. Yeah. You know, but it so can represent, you know, all sorts of places. No, that's true. But I mean, in terms of the fact that like, it's only it's only reason she's probably sent to Bucharest, in mm, the sense yeah. that they've tried to keep that kind of they've just tried to keep the that realism there, that authenticity. Yeah, yeah. I suppose so. Yeah, it's <laughs> another just one of these things. Yeah, and I think for one second I know it's when I was watching that it is <sighs> the whole idea of the videotape made me think of the ring. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, understand that sort of analogy there. Yeah, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, like an idea of like, uh, the cuss tape in a sense, although it wasn't really cuss, but I, I know it reminded me, of, and I did read somewhere they were looking to kind of emulate the tone of that movie in Japanese horrors, and I don't think they did that at all. No, you you would never get that unless uh, somebody actually said to you that's what they were, they were definitely going for because there was no hint of that whatsoever in the, the film. It would have made it a bit, again, it would have made it a better film for people to actually enjoy, but no, they were nowhere near that, unfortunately. No. But having said that, if, it, if they'd achieved something like that, would it have been a better film? Because then you would have just compared it to Ring, and you would have said, well, Ring's far superior to it. It's just a, a cheap knockoff of that. They can't really win with those sort of comparisons if they do pull it off. Maybe. I think you can win if you bring out a good film regardless. You, you can, I can't think of anything off the top of my head now, but you can watch something and go, oh, that's just a rip-off of that. But it's still enjoyable. Yeah. Without spoiling the film, what did you think of the ending? I was slightly confused by the ending, and I, I don't think it was that difficult an ending. I just kind of, it just kind of ended and I was like, "What is is that?" I was, I think, I was expecting something else to happen, and it just didn't sort of come to anything, and it, it just left me a wee bit perplexed and a wee bit confused at the end, which is it's, unusual. It's the first Hellraiser film to do that for me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> at it the felt end, to me, yeah, it felt to me that they just ran out of money and they had this big budget third act ending that a game was kind of rewritten just for the hell was a tie-in mm-hmm. and then didn't really know what to do. It keeps reminding me yeah, a film, but the film doesn't exist because a mate of mine wrote, uh, wrote it and I don't think I've ever got it made. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why I can't even compare it to that I can't really explain it. <laughs> but it's the idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Without kind of a spoiler, it kind of gives you the idea maybe this is in a kind of loop. Yes. This will happen again and again. And that kind of goes back to previous heroes of films, the idea that you're living your own hell loop, where hell can repeat on itself. I don't think that's what they're going for here. I think that's just a coincidence. Yeah, I think so. I think, that, I think they just went for, like, I don't know if ambiguous is the right word, but for lack of a better term, they went for an ambiguous ending mm-hmm. to kind of give you a bit of, kind of mystique to it. But I don't think it does really do that. And it felt very rushed as well, because you kind of get to the third act, You've got a uh, Le Marchand, this kind of mythical family of the franchise, and then it comes face to face with Pinhead. You know, oh, this could this might be at least a, a good laugh, Pinhead and the Deaders, and it's not. 
and it's just really bad CGI. And even Doug Bradley looks like he can't be asked. Yeah, he didn't have a, a whole lot to do in this film. And because of that, it, it almost if he was just kind of phoning it in. So you were mentioning earlier about like when Pinhead pops up in the movie. See with the first film, mm -hmm. they don't know what's in there. They don't, they don't know they've got it. So the idea of Pinhead had been in it, it's fine because yeah. he's not supposed to be the focus. Even with the second one, embarking himself onto Julia to be the main villain, so the focus was on her. So it's understandable Pinhead isn't in it a lot. By the yeah. third movie, they've changed that completely. Not like, right, let's just get the camera on this guy or the focus on him. And it is like that for the next two movies. By the fifth one, they try something different. And I think it works. And they've almost tried to, keep, to re replicate that formula mm -hmm. for the directed video sequels. Let's have a film about something else and then try and put Pinhead at the end of it. Now, I think it worked with Inferno because of the way the plot intertwined and had this kind of film noir supernatural element to it. It didn't work as well with the sixth one, but at least you had Kirsty coming back to kind of give it that Hellraiser tie in, which worked a bit better. Here, it's just like, that's just, it didn't work. And you don't, you don't want to watch a Hellraiser film. You don't, I saw a Hellraiser sequel. Not to see Pinhead. Mm -hmm, it's, it's a, even like the Friday the Thirteenth Halloween films and that you ramp it up as the films go on. You get more of the guy. You get more of what you came to see. Especially when you're plastering the guy over the video. Mm. Video yeah. cover, I should say. It's the, the main selling point, and then when you you hardly see him, and when you do see him, you're disappointed in what he actually produces on screen. Then yeah, it does it doesn't leave a good taste, does it? Yeah. I was just trying to say that. I thought, I thought this film was 2005, but it was released 2005. I think it was filmed in 2002, mm -hmm. which is a hell of a time for them to come out. That's a big gap when you yes. think about it. Oh, definitely. Yes, I, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was filmed in location in Romania in 2002. Maybe that's why it's even more dated, seemingly, than, than it was, because they were taking on influences for it was popular at that time. It's not my favourite, like I said. It's, I, I think it's the weakest century to the franchise. It's surprisingly yeah. though, I've, I've read about it. I think it's one of the more, it's better. It didn't do well critically, obviously, but it, in terms of fans, I think a lot of fans have a soft spot for it, which surprised me because a mate of mine, Richard, as well, who a big fan of the podcast, we shout out for you, Richard. He hates this film as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, like I said at the top of the, the show, there's not very much going for it at all. It's bland, and you don't want that in any film, and you certainly don't want it in a Hellraiser film. I was quite disappointed in this film, to be honest. It just wasn't yeah. up there at all. Just a shame. No, I know. I mean, we get to the seventh in a franchise, uh, and you're getting this kind of quality. What chance have you got? Mm. And I'm not even saying that totally cheap because obviously, I mean, a New Nightmare by Wes Craven was the seventh entry, and it's arguably the second best in that that franchise. I mean, some people would think it's the best. It's a great, great film. Halloween Seven was okay. Halloween Seven was pretty poor. I knew that one, <laughs> but no, no. Halloween Seven was age two. Oh, that was all right. That was not too bad. And maybe, they, maybe they did a reboot for it to be successful. Possibly, yeah. Fast and the Furious Seven was good. Yep. Was. Friday, Friday the Thirteenth Seven is not the best, but it does have the first film starring Kane Hodder as Jason. So there's that. Nice. But anyway, I'm going to start talking about Seven, the real Seven. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll go on to the eighth entry in the Hair Wizard movie. Uh, this was actually filmed back to back with Deader, yep. which just shows you how much interest the studio really had in these movies. They're just churning them out at this stage just to keep the rights. And it's disappointing that a franchise with such potential becomes a, a marketing gimmick, really. Yeah, no. not good. No, it's not. But Hellraiser 8, also known as Hellraiser, Hellworld. If you need anything, just scream. Now again with Hellseeker and Dead, I don't like. I'm not loving this title because Hellworld in itself is okay, but Hellraiser Hellworld nah. clunky. It's clunky. I like it, but the plot is about a bunch of gamers playing and how do you pronounce this? M M O R P G. What is that, Joy? I'm not a big gamer. It's a role playing game, but yeah, it's a uh, oh, it's like an open world role playing game. So it's like massive. I think it's massive multiplayer online 
role playing game. So it's you know basically a world that you're you're yeah. in. And you can go anywhere in it, and you can interact with anything. And there's all sorts of events and things set up. Like I think Fortnite's a pretty good example of probably the top of the current ones because it's just it's never ending. You know, there's no it's not like a standard game where there's a start, middle, and end. Here it just goes on and on and on. A lot of games are doing that now, like the likes of Red Dead. Red Dead Online is exactly the same. It's just, it's massive. You can go anywhere and you can basically do anything you want, that kind of idea. So you're trying to tell me that Hell World was actually ahead of its time? Pretty much, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, this is the gamers playing this, this RPG game based on the heroes of films. We'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. And they soon find their lives endangered after being invited to a rave, the host of which intends to show them the truth behind the Cenobites' mythos. Or mythos, sorry. This film stars Lance Henriksen, Catherine Winnick, and Henry Cavill. Now, that's three names <laughs> that are fairly recognisable. Mm. Although, Lance Henriksen at this point is the star of the movie. If you're not counting Doug Bradley, because Lance Henriksen at this point is just your go-to cult movie actor for low-budget movies. Catherine Winnick's still fairly young, kind of, she's not made fame from Vikings or anything like that yet. Henry Cavill is obviously not Superman by this stage. There's still a few years to go, but then I think this film has the least to do with Hellraiser, I think, of the entire franchise. However, I quite like it. I think if you took away the Hellraiser elements, this would be a, a, a decent, I think it is a decent horror movie in itself. I think the Hellraiser elements do nothing but drag it down. I think if you took the Heroes of the Elements out of it, this would be a fairly memorable horror movie. Pretty much in the same vein as Urban Legend, like I know you did last summer, and even Scream, which it builds heavily from in its ideas. But it's Heroes of movie, it just doesn't work at all. Which is a shame because there's a lot about this film I do like. Yeah, there's so many elements in it that are just sort of basic modern genre horror films, aren't they? The group of people all in a situation together and each one of them is slightly different you know you, you've got the jock you've got the sort of there's the party girl there's the studious girl and all this and it just goes on and everything that kind of happens to them throughout this film is you, you could script it yourself basically if you'd seen enough horror films because there's n nothing new here now that's not to say that some of the stuff isn't done very well and they, they took a slightly different approach with this film as well in that they it had a, a rock soundtrack, for instance. Everything was basically some form of rock or metal music that was played, even the ballads, I think. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, they, they came straight from that genre of music, so that kind of set the scene for that as well. But, yeah, it, it was really just... It's almost like a, I like to say scream, but there was the haunted house element of it as well because it was all set within the one house. And if you had snipped out the bits that had Pinhead and the various other Hellraiser elements, then yes, it would just be a, it would be a, a reasonable horror film. It wouldn't be, a, I don't think it would be a particularly memorable horror film, but it would be okay and you would be none the wiser that it was ever intended as a Hellraiser film. I think this is another one of these films, isn't it, that was written not as a Hellraiser film and the elements were then crowbarred into it in order to make it so. Yeah, I think I think I should actually I should actually have this to hand, you know, I should have done my research instead. I'm just kinda of like winging it as usual. This was yeah, the script was based on a short story called Dark Can't Breathe. Um I, I knew it was based on a short story. And it was adapted how it was a script. This is technically the first original script since Bloodline because it was written to be a how it was a movie, although mm -hmm. it was based off an entirely different piece of work that had nothing to do with how it yep. So in terms of a script, it's original for the series, but it's not an original story in the same way the, the first four were. Yeah. I, I personally thought, I, I know you said that you quite enjoyed it. I was quite kind of disappointed in it because I was expecting something a, a little bit more from it rather than what I got. When, well, again, this is without going into spoilers because if anybody's going to watch it, then they should go in as fresh as possible. But as soon as certain things started happening and certain characters started acting in the way that they were, 
you kind of knew what was going to happen to them and pretty much how it was going to happen to them. <laughs> there was one scene, for instance, where they're, they're being given the tour at the start and they come across this lab and there's a big hook on a chain and you go, well, well, that's going to come into it quite soon, isn't it? You know, there's, there's nothing <laughs> left to chance here. It's, you know, if, it, if it's featured a couple of minutes before, then yeah, you're going, you're going to get it. So, aye. It, it, it did raise it a wee bit, the fact that there was a decent set of actors in it. Obviously, at various stages in their career, as you say, Lance Henningsen was at that point a sort of a go-to guy for these type of movies and he doesn't really need to do very much to come across as being quite sinister and evil but yeah the, the rest of them were they, they hadn't quite found find their stride if you like in terms of their acting chops I don't think they were they were getting there but I think that's one of the things that makes the film fun though is seeing uh, well known actors now especially like uh, A-listers Mm -hmm. and see them in this, and I find that adds to the kind of the fun element to it, especially Henry Cavill, not just because he's the biggest star to come for the movie, but the character he plays is just this, it's really different for stuff you see him in now as well. Yes. And it, it looks like it looks like he's having some fun with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is basically playing a, a jockey teenage guy in this one, who thinks that he knows everything, and obviously he's uh, without really getting enlightened at some point uh, during the film, as most characters in a Hellraiser film do. But yeah, it's, I, I don't think even the interest of seeing these actors in early roles was enough to keep me interested in it. It just kind of washed over me after a while, and I'd, I kind of guessed the reveals and everything as well. And again, this is another one where Pinhead is only shown in parts. You don't see very much of him at all. Which and again plastered all over the posters. <laughs> there's, there's really no point of him even being in this film. Well, if you look at the poster for Hellraiser Hellworld, it's purely Pinhead with Evil Goes Online written in the forehead. <laughs> and he's hardly there at all. I love that tagline though, Evil Goes Online. You're like, oh <laughs> man, how like how dated does this idea seem now? Uh, the, this kind of like lawnmower man style horror movie <laughs> um, it just it almost kind of feels like a jump the shark moment as well because before I seen this movie and I just saw the poster and I saw the tagline and I thought you kind of glimpse what it was about that's what I imagined, I imagined this kind of virtual reality hell world where Pinhead's really killing people and that's what they're kind of insinuating in the movie but that's not really how it kind of plays out either and they, they don't I think the big crime for me is they don't play enough in the fact of how meta it is. They don't go into it enough for me. I, I want to see Doug Bradley kicking about without the makeup on. Yeah. As Doug Bradley. I want to see things like that. Interesting. Uh, Lance Henriksen was originally approached to play Frank Cotton in the first Hellraiser movie and turned it down. Mm, didn't know that. It's good. Yeah. I turned he it down. Been, to... mm, a, yeah. a different type, different style, obviously. Oh, it'd have been totally different, but it would have been an interesting to see how he played it. Interestingly enough, he did turn it down to play the lead role in Near Dark. Um, the lead vampire, I should say, which I love that movie. I've mentioned it a few times in the podcast over yeah. the last while. But yeah, again, not going to spoil it. What did, you, what did you think of the ending of this movie? I thought it had two twists. One, I quite liked, and the other one was just cheesy. I kind of guessed what was going to happen all the way through and the ending was no different and so because of that it was it was expected and it it was just really it was really a bit dull to be perfectly honest i didn't think it really sort of nailed the landing in any way just you kind of knew when as i say when certain things are introduced especially like the the mobile phones the old nokia mobile phones you knew that they were going to play a part all the way through it and you knew that they were going to play a part right to the very end of the film as well and you're just like yeah well, i'm glad you mentioned that because apparently this movie has a record set in 92 instances of product placement of a single product the oh, nokia right. 3210 which let's be honest is a cracking phone oh yeah it's a good phone yeah but uh, it's, it's obviously the choice of evil <laughs> <laughs> 92? Just imagine Pinhead sitting playing Snake. 
Yes. Aye. <laughs> but yes, what did you think of the ending then? Since you've you you I, really... I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. And it was basically that one last scare type thing. It's it's the end uh the test chainsaw massacre type idea. Mm, no, yeah. not test chainsaw massacre. How's a thousand corpses I'm thinking of when you think they got away and you see the sorry big spoiler here and you see like the villain get off in the back seat. It's that it's, it's I'm gonna just spoil a lot of horror films here. It's the maniac corpse hang from through the water. It's it's carry. That, it's carry. Aye. It's uh, the end of Nightmare on Elm Street when he smashes through the door. It's just you think he's gone but he's not. Mm. Although in this and I just think I've just spoiled the ending there as well, actually, for this. But it doesn't matter. I don't think anybody's going to watch this movie. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because you've seen these movies, let's be honest. Yeah, well, by this point, yeah. Aye. We're talking about diehards, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was... The film, what, the plot was meta, but didn't play enough in it for me. I wanted mm. to see more of a, sc- a scream element to it. Although the plot was more like, I know you did last summer, in terms of its uh, story. I think, taking the heroism elements... Keep it for what it was. I think this could have been a pretty... I mean, you're making five years too as well, but this could have been a pretty decent horror movie in its own right. Yeah, yeah. It had the potential for it, but it just never really pulled it off in any way, unfortunately. Also directed by Rick Botter, who came back for his third hell was a movie. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. I think uh, he was kind of done by that point, though, wasn't he? I think he was. That was his last hurrah. Yeah. So, would you recommend this film to anybody you like or anybody you don't like? See, when you see if you've watched the first seven, you're yeah. probably just as well watching the eighth one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for completeness more than anything else, because these films are not long. They're they're not going to tax you in terms of your time. They're all less than 90 minutes. I think some of them are even like 79, 80 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, you're you're not really going to be burdened. It's like no. a couple of episodes of EastEnders, you know. Ex- ex- exactly. You know, it's like you're going to be in lockdown for another six months. You can do worse than watch the 10 Hellwizard movies. Yes, aye. But then again, <laughs> once you start down that, let's like say, once you start down that slippery slope and most people are completists, they want to see all 10 and then they'll regret ever watching the first one probably because of that because they've seen all 10 <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> would you recommend that no. no i wouldn't no. I, th- I just thought it was it, it, it wasn't even up to the standard of six i would say it, it was slightly better than seven but not much it was just another another disappointing entry when you you kind of hope that somebody will come along and take the reins of it and do something like Scott Derrickson did, for instance. Exactly. Changed, yeah. it, changed it up a wee bit, made it interesting, but no. At this point, it just seemed as if they were just playing on the, the image of the pinhead character in the hope that somebody would buy the DVD only release of this film. And things, unfortunately, don't get much better from there with the ninth entry, Hair Razor Revelations. I don't really get it. You guys never talk about Steven and Nico. Emma, please. What, please forget that I had a brother? Please forget that my boyfriend disappeared with him? What is on that video camera? Shut up! Ah! It's Steven! It's oh th- everyone, just stay calm. <laughs> The plus side is it has a decent subtitle for it, Revelations. I'm quite, I'm quite happy with that. It's got a kind of biblical element. I'm, I'm okay. But yeah, it follows the fates of two friends while on a trip to Mexico to discover the puzzle box when it's given to them by a vagrant in a bar. And obviously we'll do the puzzle box, but at this point opens a gateway to a realm inhabited by sadomasochistic and monsters known as the Cenobites. Everything seems quite cool until the kids return home. And it's clear something is a bit awry when they decide to take their family and friends hostage and torture them. On paper, this film sounds really good. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique idea for the series. And I think in terms of the spirit of the original movies, again, on paper, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it looks like it's going to kind of try and capture that or at least um, pay some sort of tribute to it. Unfortunately... Nothing in my opinion. This, this movie is poorly executed from start to finish, and a lot of it 
isn't really to do with anybody who's in it. It's not their fault in a lot of ways. No, you see how issues probably see how a good workman doesn't blame his tools. But when you're given ten days or something they had to, to make this film, a fraction of a budget that you, you you would usually get for the heroes of movies and you don't even have Doug Bradley returning to the role. So the entire production time of this movie was three weeks. That's the entire production time, not the shooting schedule, start to finish. We've said before that other movies in the franchise were just kind of rushed out to meet a contractual obligation that only exists to keep the rights. This film literally is that movie. At least the other ones. It felt like they were at least making a film that they intended people to buy, even if it was like a cheap cash in. With this, I don't even think this film was intended to see the light of day originally. Mm-hmm. When it was released, um, it was given one screening for cast and crew, and I think it was only that screening only existed to officially make it a movie because it had no plans to release it in DVD. This is this is what I'm sure of anyway. And it was basically the fans saying, "Oh no, we need to see it. We need to see it." And they went, "Okay, let's just release it." And then the fans went, "Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> sorry." Put it back in the box. This is a movie yeah. that I think it's a, the Blu-ray or DVD releases says from the mind of Clive Barker. Uh, Clive Barker then went into to Twitter to say, hello my friends, I want to put on record that the flick out there using the word Hellraiser is in caps, no fucking child of mine. I have nothing to do with the fucking thing. If the claim is from my mind of Clive Barker, it's a lie. It's not even from my butthole. Can't get much clearer than that, can you? <laughs> I think it's a bit harsh because I don't think it's the worst film in the series, but it isn't very good. It's very cheap looking. It just it doesn't feel like a film that should have been released. It's a 75 minute runtime, which is fairly short as well. And Doug Bradley said he only actually turned it down was because <laughs> there was no second draft of the script. <laughs> he was given the first draft, they went, I didn't think it was good or bad, I just didn't think it was finished. And his salary kept getting cut down to what he described as the price of a fridge. <laughs> and referred to the film as a cinematic ash can copy. And that idea being that it was only actually released to keep the rights with no intention of it being actually seen by the public. Obviously it has been. John, what did you think of it? Oh, it was terrible, yeah. yeah. It started off actually reasonably well because the opening couple of minutes were always like, almost like found footage. It was uh, yes. shots and things like that. I was quite interested. It was something you're not really expecting from a Hellraiser film at all because we had nothing like that up until this point at all. And it was a very sort of cold opening. It was the two guys in the, in the car and they were travelling down to Mexico and everything like that. And it kind of kept that up for the first, it was about five, ten minutes actually. We were doing that and then it just suddenly switched to you were actually seeing one of the guys doing the film and while the other guy was having sex with a girl in a bathroom. And from there, it just it nosedived. It was just awful from there. You had no interest in any of the characters. There was no sort of development in any way of the characters. And the, the, the main guy who suddenly turns up at his parents' house a couple of weeks later with without any sort of explanation he was weak. The, the whole characterization of him was really weak and everything. And, you know, you, you kind of expect a character to slightly change, especially in a horror film. You, that's something that you do. Uh, you, you, you've come to expect that because it's the whole nature of horror. It's, it's the way that people are changing and developing and morphing. But he was telegraphing every single movement that he was doing, everything that how he was like almost it was almost like a, a, a wink to the camera and twirling of his evil moustache. And again, yes. that wasn't down to the the acting. That was down to the, the script. That was that was down to what he was given to work with. And like I say, there was nothing there for them to work with. No. You could tell that there wasn't very much to it at all because of the like most of it was set within a house. It was almost like really just sort of one, two locations, and it was just very, very poorly executed. Just oh, terrible. And I, I don't want to be too harsh on the the scriptwriter Gary J. Tunnicliffe because he was very limited by time and budget in terms of what he could do with this movie. You saying, John, it's, it's 
most of set in that living room, and you're just kind of like, right, what's going on? And it's just clearly set there because it's cheap. There's yeah. no other reason for it to be there. But you're right, the film does start off very interestingly, and okay, at this point, we've seen Pinhead in Hell, we've seen them on Earth, we've seen them in space, we've seen them in some kind of virtual reality. Why not have a found footage here as a movie? It's the only thing they haven't done yet, the only cliche to take off the box. But it is the most interesting part of this film, and it doesn't get explored much further, unfortunately. It just kind of reverts back to being this very dull third-person movie. And... It's a shame because the the found footage looking stuff did seem very interesting. Mm -hmm. You could understand why they did it though, because it's very cheap to do that for a film. Yes. They've obviously taken lessons from other found footage films and how much they cost and how much they're actually uh, they get a return on their money. But yeah, they opened up a, an avenue that I thought they would have expanded on through that film, but they they just didn't. It was a real waste, shall we say. Very much so, and obviously the, the, the only saving grace we've kind of had in these movies up until this point is at least Doug Bradley comes into it, and even a poor Hellraiser movie, you can at least you at least expect a decent performance from him. Here, I don't even get that. We get a new actor in the role of Pinhead, Stephen Smith Collins. Talk about miscast. Mm, pretty poor, wasn't it? Y you come to expect a certain type of characterization of Pinhead just because it's been there's been consistency there. If nothing else, Doug Bradley has been consistent in the role and the way that he's approached it. It's always been over the top, but that's perfectly acceptable. You come to really look forward to seeing that character on screen, but when you saw this incarnation of Pinhead, it was just nah, it just thought oh, just did not work at all. No, no. It really didn't. And to the point you were just like, why even bother to have Pinhead in it? I know we've said that in the previous films, but obviously the Pinhead in it is a markable character. But it's not just the character that's markable, it's the actor behind the makeup. Mm -hmm. And that this guy does not fill those shoes very well. No, no definitely not. Yeah, it was very dull. <laughs> and you don't want that. <laughs> you don't want that of any character, and you certainly don't want of a horror character. It just did nothing for you. No, it really, really didn't. It's a, it's a very interesting and bizarre two homages at play here. That the families are called the Cravens and the Bradleys. All right, I didn't pick up. And that. yeah, yeah. So, so as, as, as a reference, as, as as meant to be a reference to Wes Craven and Doug Bradley, which I just found weird because Wes Craven has nothing to do with Hellraiser, and Doug Bradley's not in it. So yeah. the Barkers and the Bradleys may have made more sense, you know, if you wanted to do the Barkers and the Cravens. To, I don't know, just a, a very, very strange one. A famous film director who has nothing to do with this franchise and an actor made famous by these films who's not in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which, would have, which actually would have made sense in a way because at least again, some sort of tribute. But when you put it against the Wes Craven tribute, it just doesn't. It's weird. I just find it weird. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I just find it strange. And there's a lot of standard horror tropes in this. Like, for instance, I think it's the head of one of the families, or well, the both of the men go outside at one point to investigate a noise, and it's the same vagrant that was oh. in Mexico, and then they say, "Oh, well." All the phones are out, we can't get anything. You stay here and I'll go and run along the road and try and get some help. And you're just going, seriously, have you never seen a film before, mate? Come on. You know. I know. I, 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 I didn't mind the idea of the Vagrant coming into it because obviously the Vagrant was in the first Hellraiser movie. Yeah. Having rescued the box from the the fire, where it turns into a dragon, which is a weird, weird scene. Um, it's a nice wee nod to have him here. Like I say, I think the, the, screen, the screenwriter is trying to, to write a Hellraiser movie. I think he's yeah. trying. And what comes out is what someone else referred to as watching an asylum version of Hellraiser. Mm. Oh, yeah, very much so. It's a shame because the, obviously the writer has been involved in Hellraiser from, I think it was Hellraiser 3. He was doing uh, makeup and special effects, uh, special design and stuff like that. So he's obviously invested in the franchise. So. Um, it's just a bit it's, of a shame that he uh, had to produce something. I think it, it was down to the, the time and the money more than anything else that this film was so bad. I think if it would spend a bit more time and developed a few of the ideas, 
then it would have been a better film, but came nowhere close to it. No, it really did, didn't it? And this is got a cult like status among Hellraiser fans, but not for a good reason. Mm. And I think there's some people that might look at it and go, oh, do you know what? It's not too bad to me put it in perspective and blah, blah, blah. But we are talking about the director's mother in that sentence. So <laughs> this is not a good movie. I've seen it, I've seen it twice now. Uh, I still think it's better than Deader, but that's not saying much. And yeah, it's just like, yeah. But after this, you're like, right, come on, give me something good. Yeah. I deserve it. I'm a long suffering Hellraiser fan. And that takes us to Hellraiser. 10 also known as Heroes of Judgment. Let's just dive in, shall we? What we're investigating is very dark. I'm just curious. What do you see? You think you're too close to this case? Jesus Christ. It's him. What on earth is this place? It isn't. The thing about this movie is. Between the last one and this, there was a lot of rumours of a remake or a reboot with Clive Barker writing it. So the idea was that we're going to put some more investment back into Hellraiser and give it the big screen treatment, give it a cinematic uh, makeover and bring it back to a bigger audience. As has been the fucking story of this franchise's life. That never happened because things kind of rumbled on and they end up just making another movie to keep the rights. And unfortunately, that's what Hellraiser Judgment is. Again, it's another movie they've just churned out to keep a hold of their precious rights. And I had high hopes for this movie. There's a lot of things that I like. But again, I just I wasn't a fan. Mm. Strange. Of the four films we've talked about today, this is probably the one I've liked the most. And I was surprised at that because when I started watching this, I thought, I am going to hate this film from start to finish. Just with the the way that it started with the gore and yeah. the the way that it kind of set out its stall in terms of the storytelling and everything, I thought, no, this is this is going to be really, really bad. But it was a pleasant surprise as I, I watched watched it. I thought it was far better than it really deserved to be given that it was a film that was just done again quickly in order to keep a franchise going. I will need to be fair in my criticism, though. And with regards to the rest of the movies, I've seen them all at least twice. This is the only one I've only seen once. So if I watch it a second time with less expectation of that, I might be more kinder to it. But oh, let's go over the plot first. It tells a story two detectives, Sean and David Carter, who are on the case to find a gruesome serial killer terrorising the city. They join forces with our detective, Christian Egerton, and they dig deeper into a spiraling maze of horror that may not be of this world. For me, the idea of there being different elements of hell, I thought was excellent. I thought that was brilliant. I love the fact that Pin has got his little corner of hell, and you've got this other character known as the auditor, played by the director, actually, Guy J. Tunnicliffe, who was the writer in the previous movie. Mm-hmm. I thought that was great because you've got Pin his version of hell, which looks very different from the auditors in colour tone. The Auditors is very sunblasted. It's kind of the way Inferno looked, actually, as a film. Yeah. Whereas you've got those kind of colder tones of Pinhead's world that we know of. I liked that. I thought the character the Auditor was great. But for me, the film really fell down when everything went back to Earth and concentrated on the detectives and that, which it did for a lot in the movie. And I found that was my biggest issue with it. And that's why overall I uh, was disappointed. I also like the fact that they bring it back ties to the first movie by going to the 55 for the vehicle place that the original f- house was of the first movie. Obviously, they, <laughs> it's been magically transported from England to America. I mean, a quibble. I, I liked that. And when the movie opened with that, I thought, oh, this is quite good. I, I like this weekend. I nod. And yeah, the detective stuff just really dragged for me. I liked the stuff in hell. I love the fact that they brought an angel into it. And kind of explored that idea. The director felt to me it was really going for a kind of world building of his own, but mm. obviously incorporating the Hellraiser elements. It was really good. It had this really ambitious idea, and it didn't have the time or money to do it in judgment. It just, all the detective stuff just done nothing for me. I thought it was poorly acted and a really, really weak story. 
Yeah, you're, you're totally right there. The, like I said, the start of it was very good. It was very intense. It was disgusting <laughs> more than anything else. There was a lot of fluids floating about and on screen uh, oh, yeah. quite a lot of the way through the first sort of 10, 15 minutes. And the way that the colours were all emphasising the fact that this was just it was, it was a horrible, horrible environment. And the, the people as well, obviously there was the, the three women whose faces were all in bits and it was, is it the assessor, the guy that comes in and eats the paper and then vomits it into a tube? Yeah, or, it was. Or, yeah, I can't, I don't, was that the assessor or was that the main guy it was the assessor? I'm, no, the auditor yeah. was the main guy, the, the assessor yeah, was, was the yeah, character. So yes, he would pour uh, the tears of children onto the paper and then eat it. I thought that was quite a nice wee touch. And he would, he would be, it'd be almost sexual for him when he was eating this paper with a knife and fork of all things. So yeah, that was good. But yeah, it, the police elements of it was just a police procedural. I, I don't know why the two main characters were brothers either. I've got no idea. There was, I, I, I was trying to think of a reason why they were brought in together as brothers other than sort, sort of a familial bond. But yeah. and, and then the, the third character, the, the female detective who was brought in, that was completely wasted. It was, that yeah. was a real waste of time. You could have done without that because that just didn't really do anything at all for me. I just thought that's not fun. Yeah, so the, it was almost like two different films. There was, like you say, there was a certain amount of world building in there. There were things that were left open towards the end of the film that they could have expanded on in order to take this forward, like you say, the different factions in hell and obviously the representative from the good lord above as well. But I it it was far better than the previous rushed film, put it that way. But definitely. It it did have its problems and the, the problems were with the the earth based stuff. There was the not the main detective character, Sean, his brother. I thought he was awful. I just thought yeah. he was he was terrible as a character and he just wasn't developed in any way and he wasn't particularly acted in a, a very good way either. It was just it just didn't come across well, which is a, a bit of a shame because you you want a strong sort of sidekick in these sort of elements. So you've got if if you're going to go for the buddy cop thing, then you're you're wanting two sort of strong characters that work well together, but there's a lot of differences between them, so they play off each other and everything. I mean, you just didn't get that at all. Just it was it was unfortunately it seems to be the word of the evening, but it was a bit bland. Yeah, and for me that's where the film kept kind of falling down and that's what it kept going back to and I, I like a good post procedural um, I don't mind a, even a by the numbers post procedural like Lucifer for example the TV series is very by the numbers weekly police drama but it's got that element of the devil and hell and heaven and all that it really adds to it so you can get away with having this like uh, stereotypical cliched plot each mm. week with here I think it worked because it didn't really tie in enough with what was actually going on. It was quite uh, the fact that they're chasing down a serial killer known as a preceptor and he's killing people and linking it back to Ten Commandments. It's got an element of seven to it. And it's also got uh, a lot of similarities with Inferno. Mm. Yeah, oh, it definitely does, yes. yeah. The seven stuff was quite interesting because obviously the opening titles was all typed out and everything like that, and that was, there was certain callbacks to that in the music in it as well. It was very sort of Nine Inch Nailsy, wasn't it? Yeah. It, 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 the guy has obviously gone on record and saying, yeah, that was the kind of vibe he was going for, but I think it's more of a taking quite a lot of elements of the music from that and uh, just repurposing it. To a certain extent, it was more than just a homage. I think this was a wee bit, yeah, copying maybe. Yeah, and I can remember uh, Clive Barker wanted an industrial band to do the score for Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. The studio said no. So yeah, as you say, it was too much kind of influence in a way, even stuff people might not have been aware of. Yeah, uh, yeah but it it did because I'd, I'd seen Seven reasonably recently. There were certain things you could pick up on right away with some of the effects, but yeah, definitely with the music, you could, you yeah, could definitely see that in there. Which you know, it's, it's not a bad thing if it's done well, but it was could have been varied a wee bit, done a wee bit better, which 
again. It's unfortunately, but I mean, you have to be realistic. This and the previous films are films that have had very small budgets and they've been done very quickly. So you you kind of you take your pleasure so you can get them with these films, I think. And this movie had a very similar budget to the previous one. It, it, see if you showed them side by side, you would not know that. You wouldn't know that they had the same budget because no. it looks far there's a lot more effort going into the the world building in this one and the way that things look, especially this whole sepia tone and some of the designs. Especially the, the design of the auditor was fantastic. I thought that that looked really good. Apparently that was uh, a repurposed alternative pinhead look with the slashes across the face and everything. There's some concept art for pinhead and as well as having the, the pins, there was slashes going on in between them. And that's, yeah. kind of, he, he repurposed that for a look at that character, which was, it was, it was a, that was a really good character because he came across quite officious and everything. He almost came across as a bit of an office manager as well, which I, I thought was quite a nice touch. He's sitting behind his yeah. keyboard typing away, yeah. Definitely, for me, that was the one of the biggest, the biggest strong points of the movie was the director in that role. I thought he played it very well. The character mm-hmm. was very interesting. The idea of the, the, the Stygian Inquisition, they were called, and you've yeah. got Pinhead. Actually, just the idea that there's different, there's different parts of hell with their own rules. Mm-hmm. I really did like that. And, and speaking of Pinhead, actually, what did you think of uh, Paul T. Taylor in the role? I thought he was okay. To be honest, he wasn't as good as Doug Bradley, but he he underplayed it. He didn't try and push the character in like a, a real sort of different direction or anything. He was reasonably still and quite menacing at times. So yes, I thought he was he was okay. He wasn't in the same sort of league, but he, he did a far better job than the guy before. He really did. Definitely, yeah, I quite, I quite liked him in the role as well. And it's not even a kind of case, uh, well. Because it was a massive improvement on what came before. Um, I, f- I thought it was pretty decent in the role. He played. It, it's difficult to do this kind of role and not remit it and not compare it with Doug Bradley. Mm. It's, just, it's just too iconic in it. But he played Pinhead with that gravitas and that grace that we were familiar with. And it was very, very cold in a good way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it made it in such a way that they would switch between the browns and the sepias into this very cold environment. He'd just be sitting there and he'd not be doing very much. It's almost as if he's contemplating. He's almost like moving pieces about the board. It's almost like a chess game in a certain way. And yeah, it was, it was, it was solid. It was a solid performance, I thought. And yeah, you, you, can't, you can't really fault that sort of performance because he, he didn't try and make the character larger or make the character really radically different to what had gone before. He was quite respectful to what was actually in the body of work. Exactly. It didn't, didn't try and put himself over in a way. He just put the character as a character should have been played, especially in the relation, the context of the movie. I thought it was, yeah, I thought it was a good performance. I wouldn't mind seeing him again in the role. I'd be quite happy with that. And as much as I have been quite critical of this movie, I would happily see a sequel to it. Yes, I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to see more of Tinnicliffe's world that, that he's been building with Heaven and Hell. Mm-hmm. And I like the end of this movie as well, although it was very rushed. It just kind of happened, and I had to kind of rewind it and read up in it and say, "Did I see that right? Is, have I caught that?" Because it was just a quick, quick cut, and it was gone. It's a very bold ending. Mm-hmm. Oh, it definitely is. Yes, again, wouldn't like to spoil anything, but yeah, it worked very well. Left things open for moving forward, like you say for some sort of a sequel or some sort of development, not necessarily a Hellraiser film, because there are now other elements in there as well. So it'd be interesting. So definitely. You've got that Hellraiser TV series coming out and is that gonna be I don't really know so much about it. I don't think it's gonna be a standard week to week retelling of the first movie. Is it going to be more of a kind of an anthology style series that kind of builds in the world and explores different elements? There's there's some amazing Hellraiser comics out there that do that brilliantly. They really explore different elements of the world and building it. And if you can do something like that, 
I think it'd be really good, and I'd really, I'd really, I'd happily see these elements uh, return. Yeah, definitely, there's, there's definitely scope for it. TV series would probably fit it quite well, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you want to go for some kind of multiverse idea, and you have two pinheads, you get Doug Bradley come back to <laughs> to find <laughs> other pinheads. We seem to be all the rage these days. Multiverse, but and um, have you seen a film called Cradle of Fear? No, I have not. I, f- I think it might have been the late 90s, early 2000 that I push uh, but Alex Chandon. Alex Chandron. Uh, it's a low budget horror, British horror movie that you can tell the director's a big fan of Hellraiser. It's not like a rip off friend for that, but there's certain elements of it would remind you of Clive Barker. This movie reminded me of it in not in a good way. Uh, the look of it had a very similar style and how it was shot it reminded me of that movie and I couldn't get it out of my head and thought so so I think that takes that wee bit for me as well bizarrely enough I think it's mean, a fear it's a terrible movie I have seen it loads of times it's awful though it's, it's not good it's terribly acted <laughs> it's, it's like Danny Filth Filth is the the lead villain it's got Emily Booth in it uh, oh it's awful but again, it's just you need to see it actually if you if you can if you, if you get a hold of it, watch it. Honestly, it's it's a kind of anthology film, all kind of linked. And to be fair, one story and it's really good, like really good, and the rest is trash. Mm. But yeah, this movie reminded me of it, and it was almost it was too clean looking, too digital. Yeah, well, I suppose that's in the sort of the earthbound part of this film. It was very clean, wasn't it? Which yeah. I thought was maybe done as a contrast to the uh, the more sort of grimy, gory stuff. But it may have been, it may have been, and again, though, it just had that kind of blandness to what was going on on Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd be interested to kind of read like the script of this. Apparently, the director uh, did pitch a movie to Dimensions like in the nineties called Holy War. Here was a holy war. Yes, uh, I, and you can see. I'd, I'd like to be that. Like he, he's he's like budget unlimited idea of what to do with this kind of film. The idea of like I don't know, like pinhead, like riding a chariot against an angel or something. I don't know. I just that kind of imagery would be incredible. But yeah, unfortunately, but you're not going to do much of that with a three hundred grand budget. No. Again, if TV series is ambitious enough, you might get stuff like that in it. Yeah, you might do. He's in long arc or something, you know. Cool. Something else with this movie, it's, it's, it's quite wasted though. There's Heather Langen camps in it, mm-hmm. in a very blink and you miss her role. Yeah, a shame. It's that type of movie though, isn't it? There, there's, there, there wasn't really very many big parts in it at all. There was maybe what three, four characters, four sort of main yeah. characters, and everybody else was very small, small roles. So, yeah, yeah, it's a shame. She should have oh. been there, the detective. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that would have been a nice twist. Actually, yeah. So, in terms of these last films, seven through ten, what was your favourite? I'm still going to go with eight, only because it was the most fun I had mm-hmm. watching the, the sequels of, of, of these of these ones. For many, in many ways, I think maybe this is a better Hell's a movie, but eight for me was the most fun. Yeah. Well, I would go for ten, basically because they were trying something a wee bit different and. Uh, it worked more than the other films. Obviously, there was a, a wee bit of nine, first ten minutes or so in nine were interesting, but then that rapidly went downhill. So, yeah, I think this is probably the most original ideas out of all of them, out of seven through ten. The others are fairly standard horror ideas, but this one, te- I had ambition, which I liked. It didn't pull it yes. off entirely, but it definitely tried something, which... Uh, it's very unusual for a film that is number 10 in a series, you know. Yeah, you, you took the word right in my mouth there. This film is very ambitious and you can't fault them for that. You really can. And like I say, I think, I think those elements did work pretty well for what they could do. Yes. So that's us then. We have <laughs> covered a whole series of movies. That's obviously 10 in total that we've covered over the three Separate over, I mean, this one is uh, well over the hour mark that we've, we've taken this yeah. today, so it's a fair amount of talking we've done for <laughs> 10 film. movies. It's quality <laughs> 10 movies, three podcasts, one pandemic. 
Yeah, nobody's saying they're linked, but nobody's saying they're not. <laughs> oh. But yeah, I mean, the, the big thing is as well, we we'll probably, unless they do kind of bring some of these elements out of the TV series, we probably won't see a sequel to this movie. They're probably they're still pushing for that big budget reboot. Mm-hmm. Even yep. with the TV series coming along, they're still wanting to the movie. Yeah. Aye, but they'll always try and do some sort of film element. And I think it's safe to say that they'll try and keep them separate because any projects that have seemed to have been put together where they're trying to mix it up with film and TV, like doing a film and then having a TV series running into it, you know. Uh, I'm thinking of The Dark Tower. That was supposed to be a film followed by a couple of TV series and then another film after that. And obviously it fell at the first hurdle. So... I think if they keep things separate, then there's you know there's n- there's no issues with them making a TV series and a film then because one is not dependent on the other in any way. No, I'm both seeing the light of day. That's what's trying to get at. Yeah, definitely. And I think they're doing something similar with the Child's Play movies, mm. where they're bringing out a TV series which is going to be a direct sequel to the films, but obviously we've had the reboot movie with Mark Hamill. Which I really liked. I, th- I thought it was it was great. But again, that's that's more of a rights thing because yeah. the rights. But then there's the the Hellraiser rights have reverted back to Clive Barker, but not the film rights or something. Like it's it's quite confusing. But he can now continue to do Hellraiser stuff, but he just can't do films. I think is what it is. All right. Yeah, it's, it's something. It's, I can't remember what it's as it's some some rights have reverted back to him, but not the the film rights. I'm mm. sure it is. I need to double check that actually and get back to you on it. But in fact, I think I might have mentioned it in a previous podcast. So if you're listening, go back and check out. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you about podcasts. I just what, listen to them all. I just download every one of them. That's the safest yeah, thing to do, folks. Exactly. Exactly. So don't Google that. Just uh, look for it on the podcast. And if you find it, let us know what podcast it is. And you might win a prize. You might. <laughs> you may not like the prize, but you'll get a prize anyway. Yeah. For this, as an idea for her with a story, somebody has to go back and listen to all her podcast to unlock the puzzle that takes them to hell. I wonder who would have who would have his pinhead in that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to send Mary some uh, Baby Yoda picks as pinhead just to freak it out. <laughs> Which there is, there is oh, one. Oh yeah, I've there seen some of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> John, is there anything else you want to say about the Hermes of movies or anything else in general before we wrap this podcast up? I, I think I'm pretty much spent in terms of Hellraiser. I, I couldn't think of a another single thing to say other than if an 11th film came out, I would watch it. <laughs> Just more of a completist more than anything else. But yeah, once you're hooked into these films, you do want to kind of watch them all and just see where they're going and what they're going to try next. And with 10, there was the hope that something good could come out of it and there was a possible future for it so yeah I'd be quite interested in watching another one what about you? Oh definitely but I'm I'm a huge fan of the the, the stories the movie I've got the comics and things like that I've got I've actually got a, a puzzle box a replica in my living room and do you find do you think that there's a little bit of nice poetry with the fact that the idea of the Hellraiser movies especially originally was taking pain and pleasure and intertwining them so they're indistinguishable. That's what it's like when I watch these movies now. So it's all one big loop then. Yeah. Yeah. I watch them knowing that, you know, I'm not going to enjoy this, but apparently it does put myself through it. No, you're you're totally right. Yeah, there is a there's there is a certain amount of pain in watching them. No matter how much we, we slag off these films, there's always something that you can take from the films. You get some sort of pleasure from it. It may be quite perverse pleasure, but you, you always get something from it, no matter what. So, uh, aye, that's why we keep going with these things, really, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Roll on here was a eleven. Roll on the reboot, re- re- remake the TV series, the Netflix special, the make how to make a murderer documentary starring Pinhead. I don't know. Just keep bringing them out. <laughs> the Tiger King, the Tiger King spin off. Spin off. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> I was trying to think of a character that could possibly be in that, but hey. Yeah, I think the, the nightclub owner for the third one have him and he's on Spy Tiger King spin off. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you enjoyed these podcasts, 
Uh, if you enjoy the movies, if you liked one or the other, if you disagree with us, agree with us, whatever, you can always contact us at Movie Scramble, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can email us at Movie Oh, I forget this every fucking week. It's ridiculous. Podcast at moviescramble.co.uk. It's not even that hard. It's not that hard. I should, I, I, there's no reason I forget this. But please well, let us know. I'm going to get you tattooed with that on your arm so you can just look at your arm and go, ah, I know what it is. I just tattooed it on my forehead because we're, I, I can see myself in the screen. <laughs> just make sure it's backwards in case yeah. it's middled. If you like the How Was a Podcast, we've also got uh, part one and two of this series. And we're also doing a Wishmaster box set special, which is was interesting, to say the least. Mm-hmm. That's one way to put it. John, thanks again for spending time with me to talk about Hair Razor. Uh, I understand you were fairly new to this franchise when you started watching it I all like myself. So um, I hope it's been uh, a journey. It has. It's been uh, a real pleasure because, as you say, it wasn't something that I was fully aware of. So, um, so it was good fun. Yep. Thanks again for your time, John. Thanks to everybody for listening. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.